Rain. How are you doing? What's up, man? So we're here to talk about this new album, Spiritual Machines 2. At the moment, as we're speaking, we're less than 24 hours before the actual release of it. How do you feel in the hours running up to releasing a new record? Uh, quite honestly, I feel literally the best I've ever felt about an album coming out and, and reaction. And part of it is because I'm like supremely confident in the work and the songs on this album. Uh, a lot of it has to do with Dave Siddick, who, who produced the record. Um, MTV. You know, yeah, he did. He did seven of the songs and a, and a good friend of ours, Jason Later, who lives here in L.A., did the other three. And they, and they both did an incredible, incredible job. So it's one of those things where, man, uh, you know, I just I've always wanted to make a record like this, but just couldn't find the means or the ability to do it. And uh, it just took, you know, someone like Dave to really come in and just take the reins. He, he called it, you know, when we first started working, he was like, this has to be, this has to sound like future rock. And I was like, that's exactly like, we can't rely on old tricks or it just seemed like rock music was getting so kind of cliche and, 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 and boring really. So we just let Dave kind of do his thing. And, you know, he's, he's a great programmer. He understands rhythms so well, makes them simple, but interesting. He's a major modular guy. So he's just plugging and unplugging things and making these really interesting, you know, sound design. And uh, he just has an extensive, like crazy selection of vintage keyboards and stuff. So we just let him go, man. We gave him like the bare bones of songs and he just helped them live up to everything we kind of had in our head. So that along with the fact that we did, uh, we released the, the record as an NFT about a month ago. Yeah. Or even soon, or even earlier than that. It, we already, we've had 500 people that have been living with it and just kind of like professing how much they love it. So that that's, you know, not that we live and die by every record and fans reaction, but it, it feels good. I'm a human. Yeah, of course. So this is obviously a follow up to the original record, which is over 20 years old now. What made you think that this was the right time to release the follow up and and how like obviously things have changed a lot. But how do you see things have changed from the original release to this one? Uh, yeah, I think normally we wouldn't think about following up on a concept record, but this one was so unique because it was Ray Kurzweil and us basing the record off his book, The Age of Spiritual Machines, it's all about predict predictions, right? Mm -hmm. So the cool thing about that is 20 years later, you, you can go back and see what Ray got right or what he got wrong. I think he got everything right, to be honest. Um, he's a brilliant man. But I, part of it has to do with, yeah, just, just that reflection, which was really interesting. But then also wanting to say, hey, this would be great to do again. I'd love to know what the, his future predictions are for the next 20 years especially knowing that we're getting much closer to singularity, you know, where you can't tell the difference between um, a human being and a machine. I think that's, that's a, you know, obviously a very profound um, watershed moment for humanity that is like literally coming up within the next decade. So then everything else he kind of talks about is it's really big concepts. You know, you talk about a UBI, like, a global universal basic income. That's really interesting what that does for poverty, the way, the way technology can, can do much more than humans in terms of helping climate change. There's just some big concepts in there that, that are really cool. Yeah. So when bands talk about technology and the future, a lot of the time it's kind of like a doomsday scenario, but you guys, although the, the themes on this record are, are pretty varied, there's a lot of positivity in there. Was that a deliberate thing that you wanted to, you wanted to go down that route? Yeah, I think it was a culmination of, of a bunch of factors. One, we were stuck in a lockdown. Like it was dark enough doing that. We felt like the record needed to be a little bit brighter. I think working with Dave was Siddick, the way he looks at rhythms, everything's a little bit more poppy and not, and I don't mean like pop music. I just mean it, it, it pops a bit. It makes you kind of tap your foot it's not a dance record by any means. There's no songs that are four on the floor, but more dance and like a gang of four talking heads vibe. You know, he comes at it from that angle, which we all appreciate and love. So that was a lot of fun. And then melding that with Ray's, Ray's outlook on the world is far from like that dystopian kind of scorched earth 
you know, that we get fed by media and film and television, right? That that's what sells. I think we all get that. But the reality is he's a he's a he's an internal optimist and and he sees technology as it has now. Um, whether I can, you know, if my neighbor has a baby that's born that's deaf, she can get a cochlear implant in here again. That's pretty amazing. And I can get food delivered in 20 minutes if I want, you know, with Uber Eats. So technology serves us all. And I think he just he just he just has always seen it as as a proponent of good. There's a, always a downside to it as well. But, um, you know, more than less, uh, Ray Ray's really optimistic. So all those things coming together, I think, make for a little bit or probably one of the brighter OLP records we've ever made. Yeah. And was the one song on the album that was like a catalyst for the for the rest of the songs? Like was the one that you started with and knew where you wanted to go? Yeah. Stop Making Stupid People Famous was really we kind of went in and, and recorded that song with Dave Siddick, not knowing if we were going to do a record. It was just a kind of one off. We were in the middle of a tour. We we're doing this thing called the Ultimate Tour down here with Bush and Live um, across all these amphitheaters in the US. And we had a break. And so we went, we went up to Dave's studio for a couple of days and, and recorded that song. And just so happened that, you know, it turned out better than we expected. And it really showed like the shift and the way that we could push the band and the way obviously that he did. So that was the, that was like the, the pilot for shit. Can, can we make a record together? He was like, absolutely. He just said, like, I, you know, just going back to that whole comment, he was like, yeah, we will, we can do this as long as you guys are down for making future rock. Who's going to say no to that? For sure. And, and speaking of future rock, one voice out there that's kind of trying to change the future is Pussy Riot, right? Who we feature on the, on the song. How, how did that come about? That's a strange collaboration to a lot of people, but it, it works really well. So, Yeah, I mean, Natty's a friend. We, um, I, I love technology and, and build different things, you know, apps and platforms mostly to, to help and serve like independent artists. But um, one, one thing we, we built um, was, was an app called Record Mob, which is really like a counterculture app, video, you know, something's going on, you see a crime, you see, a, or you're at a protest, you were, you know, this, and this is like eight years ago, like, you know, click on Record Mob and start recording it and live streaming it. It's kind of even before Facebook Live and, and some of these live streaming things were out there, but um, definitely before IG Live. Anyway, we had a big launch party in Toronto for, for the company and the platform. And we're like, like this, this is like legit a count, counterculture app. Who represents that in music that we could come like have it? And so it's pretty easy with Nadia. You know, she, she lives it. She breathes it. Um, she's 100% the real deal. So she came and she actually DJed the party, which was pretty cool. Nice. And so I knew her there. And, and then when we talked about this song, same kind of thing. It's like, you know what? first of all, it needs equity. Like, the, you know, talking about that kind of thing needs to come from, from a, a female voice as well. And, and it just felt like, wow. I mean, she's the one, <laughs> you know, she really is. She, she kind of exemplifies people who just like, really, obviously she spent time in prison for, for human rights. So it's, it's just one of those things where it was pretty easy. Dave had worked with her as well. So I think it was like, I texted her, Dave texted her next day. She was up at the studio recording. Especially over the last few years, the future has been a bit uncertain, but you have all these positive songs on this album, not all of them, but when you're putting together an album, how much time do you spend on the actual sequencing, the order of the songs, and, and how do you tell that story? Yeah, that, we especially on this album, because obviously as the interstitials with Ray talking, Synergy was a big deal. I mean, it was on the first one. It ended with, you know, and I don't know if it's ironic or not, but it ended with the song Spiritual Machines 1 and with a song called The Wonderful Future. So hopefully it was like some sort of prophecy in terms of, you know, really digging into Ray's optimism and what that would, and not knowing we'd make another record, but it was just like, hey, we need to leave on the on a front of like, this is going to be okay. And so I think, you know, we just jump off from there right into Stupid People in terms of, it not being dark and not really like that, that title was more of like clickbait into the song. The song's about like working on a dream and, you know, and trying to, you know, find community and, and forget about all that stuff. Um, and so it's, it was, it was really key. And I, and I, I think we found, you know, somewhat of a, a flow that makes an album 
hopefully digestible again to kind of sit down and listen to all the way through rather than skipping here and there. So, I mean, so far, that's what we're seeing with our fans. And this year is quite a big, a big year for the band. It's the, the 25th anniversary of Clumsy this year, but it's also the 30th anniversary of the band, right? Maybe. 20, 93 was kind of when we really were like, okay, we got a record deal, we're a band. So um, I guess something like that. But it's hard I, to keep track, man. You don't feel like too much of a nostalgia band to me. So how do you approach these kind of anniversaries? I mean, Clumsy is, a, Clumsy is kind of a big deal. I mean, that was a big record, obviously, for us. You know, we sold over a million records in Canada. I remember our record company president was like, you know, and this is back, obviously, two years ago. But he's like, you know, one in 25 people own your album. And I was like, wow. Or CD. I was like, that's that that was the first time any kind of, you know, I'm not big on awards or, or accolades or anything. But when he said that to us, it's like, that's pretty wild. Um and it gave us, you know, it definitely gave us like a foothold to, to tour the world and, and, and have an audience down here in the U.S. And so I, I definitely um, very appreciative of what that album did for us. Um, but in terms, yeah, in terms of looking backwards, don't do that very much. Uh, and definitely maybe to a fault sometimes I've never tried to repeat success, you know, in terms of, I don't know, making Clumsy Part 2 or Gravity Part 2. The only part two we've made is is right now with spiritual machines, but it's it's for for a different reason. And um, like I said, I yeah, definitely no nostalgia. This this album is by far, I think it's one of the best albums we've ever made. And it's funny, I we we started a Discord, so I get to see people talking in a different manner. They're much more in depth dialogue. It's pretty dope, man. They're like people are starting to rate this record already in like the top three. So it, I I think what we feel is what the fans feel. And so, yeah, it's, it's all about moving forward. And, and we've tapped into something that, like I said, been trying to do it for 10 years. Didn't know if it was possible. Thank God we, we found Dave and were able to do it. Yeah. So, so you touched on success there. For, for you in 2022 with this album, what would be success for you with, this, with the release of this and like the 12 months ahead? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of expectations. Obviously, the, the, the album had it, and I think we've kind of already, like, I think everyone feels very good about what, what the reaction will be to this album. Um, the next component is this tour. So I fly to Boston on Monday to spend some time with Ray in, uh, in his hometown, and we're going we're gonna to film him as a hologram, um, repeating some of the stuff that he does on the record, but also having dialogue uh, with Molly, who's a character from the first album and Cassandra, who's an AI from his new book that comes out in the fall and just really ha give him the opportunity and our fans when we go play live to, to just get a little bit more insight into how he thinks and what the future potentially holds. Not, not like a preachy way, just more of, like I said, having conversations. Um, so to do this and have Ray on the road with us and just how we're looking at this tour is um, it's pretty different, man. I, it's going to be, I don't like to say it's going to be theater, but it's not going to be a typical rock show. I think anyone that's seen us will come to this show and, and walk away saying, I, again, I hope they say, I didn't know that band was capable of that. And I haven't seen anything like that before. Yeah. Nice. That sounds exciting. It is. It's like, yeah, I, you know, usually you do an album and the tour is like, whatever, it's exciting to go and play, but there's been a, almost as much attention and like detail into putting this tour together by far more than anything we've ever planned. Just, just the hologram stuff, just scripting the dialogue, talking to Ray, going back and forth on, on how it's going to look, even the look of the, what we're doing. You're not going to have any typical like moving rock lights and all that stuff. This is a very different kind of tour that we're putting on. So I, I'm, I'm really excited about that. I, I think, I think, you know, kind of goes in keeping with, with what you said in terms of we're, we're not looking back. We're not just, relying on kind of old tricks or nostalgia. This is really about doing something different. I saw David Byrne here in LA at the shrine right before COVID on that tour he did. And I was like, okay, you know, we gotta, we gotta up our game here. That was, that was an incredible show we put on. Very different, very different. Songs still mean something and people are still gonna get the feels from all the songs. It's just about hitting different senses, you know, than, than maybe you've, you're used to at a, at a rock concert. Are there any songs from this record that you're particularly excited to play live? 
we played so we did probably did about 10 shows this last year most of them down here in the u.s and we opened with a song called the message and literally just the the kind of rhythms and the sense that start that song as we walk on stage i i i still and i'm sure it'll happen for a long time i'm just like i can't believe that's our song you know it just feels like we had this cool intro that someone made for us that we walk on the stage it's not it's like we and then we go into the song and it's just brilliant and then another song called wish you well which we also played a lot that's by far one of the most natural songs we've ever had from the first time we played it it just was like we played this a million times already because that's not always the case they take a little bit of you know it takes a minute for us to learn our own stuff really but wish you well just kind of happened and then it, it was amazing like by the second chorus we had people like almost singing along to a song they've never heard before. So that those are always like little indicators where it's like there's something here that's really special. You mentioned that you've got tour plans coming up. I know you've got some festivals in the summer as well. Um, what are your, what are your plans in Canada now? I think really is to bring this. It's called it's going to be called the Wonderful Future Tour uh, just across North America. And and just, you know, it's been a while since we've all been able to see music since we've been able to tour. And so I think with that, you know, not challenging our fans, but challenging ourselves and just putting something really unique out there is, it's really exciting. I'm honest to God, I like, you know, I'm psyched to go to Boston and hang with Ray next week and, you know, just, just get this tour on sale and, and people hyped about it. And, and then, you know, the whole NFT business as well is something that I'm deep into and just being able to connect direct to fans now with that technology is really interesting to me. And, I have an app called Drops with two R's that that we use live and is uh, it's a really just amazing utility and tool to to talk to fans and get stuff that's you know digital and physical physical but just get it direct to them with no gatekeepers. I love it. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that you're not only singing about the future of technology, but you're trying to bring it along with you and incorporate it into everything you do. And there's not a lot of people really that are doing that. So kudos to you for that. Uh, yeah, interesting time. The intersection between music and tech is like never been better than it is right now. Yeah. So my final question is, are you feeling optimistic about the future? I do. I do. I mean, I, I, I you know, obviously I think we're, we're coming out of this pandemic. I think people probably have a little bit better appreciation for music um, because of it in, in a, in a weird way, but that's that's positive you know i i I just feel like the spring and summer are just going to be uh very inspiring and and hopefully we can be a part of that just in terms of even furthering thoughts on the future i I think people are going to walk away from our tour with some knowledge of like okay it's not all doom and gloom with something like climate change not saying that you know look i drive a leaf i take my um my bags to gross the grocery store i do all that stuff but i don't know i don't know if that's working um, but when you get someone like Ray talking about technology and it being exponential and like, it's, it's going to be okay. That's pretty cool. I got young kids. They worry about climate change. I can't wait to even just get with Ray next week and, and, and hear what he has to say about it to where just the average person is like, okay, you know what? We still got to do our part, but thank God technology is there and it can help save us on these different fronts, poverty, food sources, all that stuff. It's pretty cool. You mentioned that from the first album that he got a lot of stuff, right? I hope that some of these things he gets right as well, because there's a lot of positivity in there. We need that at the moment. Yeah, hey, I'm, I, I'm with you, Stephen. I'm counting on it. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks very much for your time. It's been really nice talking to you, and hopefully we'll get to see you uh, live in a room very soon. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Say hi to your son for me. I will. Yeah, take care. Uh,